Fascinating new information on Easter Island. You're going to be hearing Dr. Barry Fell, a man that can speak the language, understands the Polynesians. How exciting it is. Lean back, enjoy Easter Island, Dr. Barry Fell. Easter Island is one of the most remote places in the globe. It lies at the eastern end of what is called the Polynesian Triangle. As you can see in the map, Easter Island lies about uh, 1,500 miles east of the center of the Polynesian Triangle, which is outlined there, and about the same distance uh, west of South America. The Polynesian Triangle covers the whole area where people who speak the Polynesian language are found. There were obviously great sailors to span such enormous distances, far greater than the distance across the Atlantic. Hawaii's at the northern tip, New Zealand at the southern angle, and Easter Island at the eastern angle. All three portions of the Polynesian Triangle were visited by Captain Cook during the 18th century, and he ultimately uh, met his death in Hawaii at the northern end. In the centre, you'll see a region marked Central or uh, Core Polynesia. That is the part that was first settled, we believe, and then voyages ra radiated out in various directions to the other portions of the settled area. The island is famous for the gigantic stone statues which occur in scores all over. The island is quite small, and yet there are an enormous number of these huge statues carved out of volcanic rock, many of them standing, some of them fallen. The island is volcanic, and it's possible that some of the fallen ones may have been overthrown by earthquake, but uh, Father Sebastian, who was living in Easter Island during the 60s reported that there was a hurricane at that time which overthrew one of the statues standing near the coast so it's possible that uh, hurricanes may partly be responsible for the destruction of statues. Apart from the gigantic statues the island is also famous for the existence of about a score of mysterious wooden tablets with uh, writing on them like you see in the slide that's showing now writing which has not been interpreted, although it uh, seems to represent pictures of people and objects. As you can see, there are horizontal rows of hieroglyphs, many of them representing human beings or animals, and at one row will show them the right way up, and then the succeeding row will show them upside down, and then the next row after that will show them the right way up again. This kind of writing is called inverse booster feed -on, and it is um, characteristic of the Easter Island tablets, though not restricted to them. Uh, you read a tablet like this. They're, they're wooden tablets, as you can see from these various modern examples. These are not ancient uh, tablets. These are modern copies made by Easter Island artists today, who, however, cannot read the original tablets, and they're just imitating the uh, hieroglyphs seen on the old ones, but they don't spell out actual words. Here is a photographic replica of one of the original old ones, which presumably does contain real writing. Um, this one is known as, each, each tablet has a name, and this particular one, the replica that I'm holding, is known as Aruku Kurenga. The Easter Islanders say that it was named after the scribe who engraved it. But if you look carefully at the two sides, here are the two sides shown simultaneously, you see that there must have been at least two scribes. There couldn't have been only one. The writing styles are quite different on the two sides. So it would appear that Aruku Karenga probably has a different meaning, and this is not really the name of the scribe who wrote it. To read one of these uh, tablets, we start the lower 
left hand side, this is line one, and we read along that way to the end, and then the next line you'll see is upside down. So we turn it over and we come back along in that direction. The right, the, now the writing is now the right way up and then turn it over again and go along the next line after that. Many ancient peoples wrote that way, first one way, then back the other way, left to right, then right to left. It's called boustrophedon because that means the track of a ploughman. A ploughman goes across the field, turns around and comes back again. In this boustrophedon, which we have here, is the name used to it when the letters are upside down on each succeeding row, so that you have to keep turning the tablet over all the time. Every time you change rows, you turn the tablet over. Some people have argued that this cannot really be writing because no matter what tablet you take, it always is totally covered with writing from one end to the other. There's never a vacant space. And they say, if this really was a message, surely the scribe wouldn't always exactly make it fit the piece of wood that he happens to have. And so they think that's not writing. However, that's a false argument. Let's look at this one. This is a version of the Ten Commandments found in uh, Ohio uh, over a hundred years ago. It's engraved on stone. If we turn it over, every single space on the piece of stone is occupied with writing. What the scribe did was to shorten the Ten Commandments until they exactly fitted on the piece of stone he had, and so he used every piece of available surface on the stone. Here's another example, this ancient Egyptian inscription. The inscribed area is totally occupied by hieroglyphs and pictures. There's not a vacant space anywhere. It's just the way that scribes worked in ancient times. They were taught to make full use of the available space and uh, not to waste any. Another reason why that argument is wrong is that there are a few objects like this pectoral that was worn around the neck, like hung around the neck by on a chieftain, that has only one line of writing on it. There's plenty of spare space on that one. So you see the argument is, uh, is fallacious. Uh, some people have said that this arrangement of uh, reading the way I've been talking about in verse booster feed on is found only in Easter Island and nowhere else, but that's not true either. Here is a copy of a letter written by a Berber about 150 years ago in North Africa using the Tifinag alphabet that we've met in other contexts. It begins here. This is the letter um, W, this is the N, that's a K, just as we found in the Norse inscriptions at Peterborough, it's the same alphabet, WNK, that stands for Wanak, which is saying, it is I. Then he gives his name, which is uh, uh, Abdusalem, B-D-S-L-M, and the vowels are left out. This is I, Abdusalem, and then he goes on to say his message. You read along like that, then you go around the corner, and you come back this way, and you turn it around again, along there, and you end up here. Here's another one in the same period written by a gentleman called Agua. He prefers to start at the bottom like we did on this Easter Island tablet. He starts down here. Again with the same formula WNK1 act, this is I. Then he gives his name which is Agua, G-R, the only letters he writes. G-R, the vowels you have to add. This is I, Agua. And then you read along there, turn it around come back upside down and round again and reach the end here. While I'm on this, I'd just like to mention one thing. It doesn't have anything to do with Easter Island, but it uh, is interesting to us who live in America. You notice each of these letters, whichever way, whichever direction you read them, started off with a fixed formula. This is I, and then the name of the person, Wanak. We have found inscriptions in uh, Nevada and um, other portions of the desert southwest which start off the same way, written in the old Tifinag in, um, letters and beginning with the formula Wanak. This is I. And then it tells you the name of the person who engraved the inscription in North America. Those are inscriptions that date, we think, from the Middle Ages. Uh, we see here in the slide now a photograph of the original of the tablet that I held up to you Aruka Kurenga, to show you how to read it. 
That's what the original looks like. The original's in uh, Belgium now, collected by the Belgian Thalers during the middle of the 19th century. The existence of these tablets was discovered by one of the missionaries sent to Easter Island in the middle of the 19th century, and he got and purchased an example from the Easter Islanders and sent it to Tahiti, where his bishop lived. The bishop became fascinated by realizing that there was some form of writing in this remote island and contacted one of the Easter Island chiefs called Metoro, who was sent to Tahiti to talk to the bishop. And uh, between the two of them, the bishop, with Metoro's help, contrived to make a picture dictionary. Here are some portions of the dictionary. The people spoke French, so the items are in French. Here we have here some verb, action, and um, you can see the various meanings to see and to be seen, the light of the sun, to polish a hatchet and so forth. Let's see some of the other examples from his picture dictionary. Symbolic characters, uh, that which is good, as you see on the top left hand side, that sign is said to represent that. Uh, another sign represents one of the constellations. Uh, converse, you see on the right hand side to hold conversation, se proste, and so forth. Let's see some more. There are four pages of these uh, explained hieroglyphs in the work that the bishop left behind. Um, composite sy uh, symbols we have here where there's uh, two symbols combined to make something. Uh, the curious one at the bottom left says noho kitaragi, to dwell in the sky that means, or he dwells in the sky, very strange meaning. Here are some on the right hand side terrestrial animals of various kinds, there's a rat at the beginning, moko, a lizard, um, a dead lizard, moko matea which is a strange thing. Why would you want to talk about a dead lizard? Uh, and a, um, an, a sign that's said to represent a millipede. Uh, here are some uh, examples of fish, poisson. Ica is the word, general word for fish. And a whole series of fishes are shown to begin with. Then we have balen, which is um, a whale, and other fishes, uh, including uh, sea urchins and things like that. We ask, if uh, the scribes are writing something, why would they want to say so much about bits of coral and sea worms and things like that? I, I grew up in New Zealand and I'm very familiar with the nature of Polynesian mythology. And they're always about men and their adventures with gods and love affairs with women. They never have anything to do with bits of coral or worms in the sea or so forth. So this is a strange thing that we ran into to begin with. Why did they have to illustrate all these microscopic creatures in the sea? And the one we're looking at now, we have some uh, examples of men of various ranks. The first one, Tiaraki, that's the king. Uh, the next one, th uh, three wise men. Toru, Araki, Tohunga. Um, on the right hand side we have symbols for the sun and the sky, Rangi, and the star, Hitu. Next slide please, we could understand why those symbols would be required, but I do not understand at this stage why they would want to be talking about all these minor animals in the sea, minor invertebrates. Um, these are items to do with constructing buildings, rafters and studs and things of that kind. Uh, on the left hand side various flowers and fruits. Uh, why is it necessary to talk about different kinds of flowers? No, I don't. Uh, this is uh, the dictionary made by uh, Bishop uh, Joisson and uh, Metoro and not the only source of information we have on the meaning of Easter Island symbols. Tor Haradol, when he visited Easter Island some years ago, made the acquaintance of a man whose father had been a prisoner, a slave, in uh, Peru, and had left some records that he had made himself in this notebook, which uh, he allowed Tor Haradol to photograph. So we have some additional information there. However, it turns out that all the signs are shown, uh, ones which are also repeated in the, the bishop's uh, uh, dictionary, so we, we don't learn much more from this. A 
A major advance in the study of Easter Island writing was made when a German professor, Bartel, made an accurate copy of each surface, every line of each surface of every known tablet that's in the European museums. As I said, there are none left on the island itself. And uh, Bartel recorded them all in printed form and made them available for students all over the world to, to study them. This was a great uh, service he did to us. I'm showing there a sample page from his publication. But uh, there's more available than that. When Metoro was in Tahiti talking to the Belgian bishop, he gave a reading of four of the largest tablets, starting, as I explained on this one, starting at one end and going line by line all the way across both sides of a tablet. He did that for four of the largest tablets. And the bishop wrote down everything he said. I have brought together here Bartel's copy of the lines of hieroglyphs on these tablets, and I have pat matched them up with what Metoro said was the meaning of each of the signs written in Polynesian, as you see on this page here. Now we have a portion of that same line, the beginning of that line, that's this um, end of the, of the tablet that I'm touching here. I'm going to talk about this uh, slide now. As you saw in the portion of the bishop's dictionary that we were looking at earlier, do you remember there was a picture of a man with two horns on his helmet and it said beside it, Rangi, the sky or heaven. That's the sign you see at the beginning of this line, the left-hand end, Rangi. But instead of saying Rangi, as Metoro said was the meaning, it says Kitirangi, which means to the sky or to heaven. Then the two signs that follow that, the vertical rod and the next sign to that, as we read towards the right, uh, Metoro said that both of those signs meant the same thing. He said they meant Hanoi, which is a word meaning land. But he doesn't write, it, he doesn't read it as land, land. According to his dictionary, what he has there is sky, land, land. But that's not what Metoro read it. When he read it aloud, he read the first land sign, was read at Kitehenua Erua, which is not even grammatical. Uh, that's saying to the land in the singular, te is the singular article, to the land, singular land, and he goes on to say erua, the two of them, which is ungrammatical, referring to the two signs. It's strange. The next sign he had said in his section called Om, men, he said it meant the king, King Hotamatua, the founder of, uh, of Easter Island. Uh, here he puts no Hotamatua, by Hotamatua, and so on. Every sign as we encounter it, we find it has extra minor words added to what he said was the basic meaning. We see the word for sky, halfway along again we come to the word to sky, Tirangi. But this time he said, Kitehitu o Tirangi, to the edge of the sky. On what authority is he adding all these extra words? Because of these extra words added in that aren't represented in the writing, some people said, he's just making it up. See if we can check this. Here we have four symbols. He said that that sign means a flying bird, manu rere. In the dictionary it's given as flying bird. Manu is bird, rere, flying. But in these four examples where it occurs in the text of the tablets, he gives different extra words with it. Um, to, to the red, the, the red bird is flying, for example, and things like that. So he's adding meanings that aren't written in the tablet. Does this mean that it's a fictitious reading? Well, we come now to the sign for heaven. You remember this one means the sky or heaven, Rangi. We have various renderings there, to rise up in the sky, to fly in the sky. The third one is very strange, Kua 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 Kitirangi, that's meant to be happy in the sky and kitahito otorangi, to the edge of the sky. And yet it's just the same symbol all the time, 
how does he know to put these different meanings to it? This we must find out before we're going to make any progress in understanding this writing system. Now we have an uh, interesting example which we can begin to compare with Egyptian writing. Here we have two signs which are exactly the same. Things which are the same shape we call isomorphs. Morph, shape, iso, the same. Two things of the same shape we call them isomorphs. So those two hieroglyphs are isomorphs. But uh, Mitoro tells us that they're also pronounced the same. Tonga, T-O-G-A. G stands for N-G in Easter Island writing. Tonga, he says, is the basic sound of that sign. So they also sound the same. So we call them isophones. Things that sound the same, we call them isophones. These are both isomorphs and isophones. Now let's look at the details of the reading. The first one, he says, is Tonga Tu. He read that as meaning erected house studs. The second one, Kite Tonga, that has the meaning to the south or to the south wind. Tonga also means the south as well as meaning a house stud. So once again we have this interesting situation that uh, different meanings are given to the sounds which, uh, to the signs which sound the same and which look the same. Depends where they occur in the text, what meaning exactly it gives to them. Now we have um, here a pair of signs on the left and a pair on the right, which are obviously isomorphs. And then they're giving the meaning to dwell. The one on the left is a picture which means to dwell. It doesn't seem to have anything to do with what the picture shows, but he said it meant to dwell or to be established. And the one on the right, he says, means rain. We have here two complex signs which are the um, same, same sound and the same form. They're homophones and also isomorphs. Uh, he's not giving quite the same meaning to the two of them though. To the land of Hotomato on the left, to the land he came hither. When Captain Cook visited the Easter Island in the 1700s, he reported that several of the leading chieftains wore a headdress made up of feathers arranged in a circle. And it's illustrated in this old diagram. Next slide, please. The name of the headdress was Hau or Hanu. When we come to look at Metoro's uh, reading of, the, of this particular symbol in the Easter Island tablets, we find that he calls it by the name that they used for that feathered crown they were wearing. Evidently, this is a sign representing the crown. But he gives, again, different varieties of meanings for it, always using the word hau. Well, hau is a complicated word in Polynesian. It can mean the wind, uh, it can mean a perfume, and it can mean the crown, as in the case of his headdress. How does Metoro know which of these various meanings to use? Here we have two sets of signs, the three on the left-hand side, the six-rayed figures, and the two on the right. Looking at the meaning that uh, Metoro gave to the th six-rayed sign on the left, we find that sometimes he calls it hetu, meaning star. Sometimes he says it's ra, which means the sun. And sometimes he calls it ahi, which means fire. As for the two signs on the right, one he says is niho, which is a word meaning a tusk or a tooth, and the next one beside it to the right he calls noho, it's the same sign, but he reads it as noho. So we have on the left hand side isomorphs, but they're different sounds, heterophones, not isophones, but heterophones, different sounds for the same sign, isomorphs. One's on the right, uh, isomorphs, the same shape, but these are the same or similar sounds. Niho and noho, they're rather similar sounds. They're not identical, but they're similar. So instead of calling them <coughs> isophones, Egyptologists would call them homophones. Now, these are things that we find in Egyptian writing, signs that have these different properties. Not the same signs that we see here, but signs that can be arranged in that way. 
begins to make me suspect that we have some form of writing similar to that used by the ancient Egyptian. As you know, people have uh, tended to say this can't be writing because uh, Metoro kept giving different meanings to the same sign as he went along. Let's do some checks in other parts of the Pacific to see if we can find some commentary. <coughs> see if we can find some commentary on that uh, comment. On the left-hand side of this chart, you see a number of signs from Easter Island with the meanings and sound values given to them by Metoro. On the right-hand side are some signs used as a writing system to this very day by the people of the Caroline Islands in Micronesia. We know that the signs really did have these sound values because they're still used today and the Micronesians will readily point them out and tell you what the sound value is. Now let's compare the two. According to Metoro in the middle of the 19th century, left-hand column, he said that the first sign looks like a post with a cross on the top of it. He said that that represented new. That's a coconut, that means in Polynesian today, a palm tree, or in particular, a coconut palm. And indeed, it looks like a palm tree. And that's interesting, because there were no palm trees on Easter Island when the uh, white people first went there. Look at the sign now on the same line on the right-hand side. It's almost the same. It's a vertical stroke with a cross on the top. And the sound value, ne, which is nearly the same as new. Now that does not mean coconut in the Caroline Islands language. Uh, look now at the second line. On the left hand side we see the Easter Island sign and the word puporo. Now that's a plant which produces a seed pod that hangs down on a, a pendulous uh, stem as you see illustrated in the picture. Puporo. It only grows in Easter Island. Now look on the right hand side. The Caroline Islands, they don't have a puporo tree there but they do have the sign and they write it the right way up and also upside down and they say that it's Po. Or well, Po is the first syllable of the Easter Island name for that plant. Now take the next one, the third one. <coughs> it, uh, according to the Metoro, it's a picture of a, of a chunk of uh, sugar cane and the word is Toa, meaning sugar cane. Now look on the right. We have virtually the same sign, same sound, Toa which is not the word for sugarcane in the Caroline Islands, and so on. We could work down all through this table, and there's much more of it, showing how the Caroline Islanders apparently have adopted the symbols used by the Easter Islanders for the same sound or a similar sound, even though the meaning has no connection in the Caroline Islands language. Here's another part of that same table with some more of those signs compared in the same way. Uh, third one from the bottom is an interesting one. On the left-hand side we have the Easter Island sound and meaning. The Easter Islanders say it represents crossed arms. The word for arm is rima, two arms crossed. On the right-hand side, the Caroline Islanders don't give any meaning to it at all. They just say it's the letter re. That's the first syllable in rima. And so on for the other signs that you see there. We've made our point, so I guess I don't need to go tediously through every one, but that's how it is. So the evidence from the Micronesian islands tends to support very strongly the notion that the Polynesians had a writing system in Easter Island, and furthermore, they appear to have been the originators of it because the signs have appropriate meanings for the pictures. Now turn to the other end of the Polynesian Triangle, we go to New Zealand. In 1840, Queen Victoria and her representatives entered into a very detailed treaty with the chieftains of New Zealand, 700 of whom put their signatures on the so-called Treaty of Waitangi, which is the oldest New Zealand document. Here is one of the pages of the treaty with the signatures of a number of chiefs in one district where every chief signed with a cross and a local missionary wrote down the translation of what the name was. Now this is just like an American will made during the 18th century, especially wills made by women who did not go to school in those days. The lawyer would write the name of the person signing and the person himself would just put a cross beside his name. That's basically what these chiefs have done. Now let's look at another page of the treaty. 
Here we see a large number of chieftains from the Wellington district in New Zealand, all of whom apparently decided to use a horizontal line with several squiggles up and down across it as their signature. Each one seems to have imitated the other, and the missionaries wrote in the names. Let's look at another page. Here are some signatures of a more interesting character from the both sides of Cook Strait in the middle of New Zealand. I would draw your attention to the fourth one from the bottom, the loop. On the right hand side it says Rangi Hayata. Rangi Hayata was a very famous chieftain in the Wellington district who lived in Kapiti Island. It says beside it, Kotitoho or Rangi Hayata, that means this is the signature of Rangi Hayata, and the actual signature is that loop of string that he has drawn. Now the interesting thing is that the word Rangi Hayata in Maori sounds almost like the word that means a loop of string. So he's chosen something that sounds similar to his name and used it to represent his name. Here's another part of the treaty. The second one down, no, the third one down, it says Titoho o Pomure, the signature of Pomure. Pomure chooses to draw the figure on the right. And Mure is a Maori word meaning, with a very specialised meaning, lava of the tiger, mo tiger beetle. Mure, larva of a tiger beetle. On this slide I have drawn at the bottom the larva of a tiger beetle. The name Pomure and Mure meaning larva of a tiger beetle and on the right is the picture the way the chief wrote his name. Obviously he has drawn a picture of a tiger beetle. So he's picked that part of his name which he could represent pictorially and used that as his signature. Next slide. These are all signatures on the Treaty of Waitangi, very well attested and carefully dated document. Now let's come to something that we can't date so accurately. This is a part of a cave inscription from the South Island of New Zealand. It probably dates from sometime in the Middle Ages, maybe about, oh, say, 1400 AD or something like that. The artist has drawn in uh, charcoal and uh, red ochre a number of great fishes, that most of them are sharks. There's a generalized word in the Polynesian language which means great fishes or sea monsters. It's tanifa. Now in the middle of a group of tanifa we see four men, four people standing. Four men. The word for men is tane and the word for four is fa. He's, written, he's drawn tane fa four men, which is as close as near B to Tanifa, meaning sea monsters. Now, I think this is clear evidence that the ancient Maori, long before the white people went to New Zealand, had this form of writing, using rabus or pictures of things that sound like what they want to say. Some years ago, not many years ago, a very fine um, program was sent to New Zealand television from New Zealand called Te Māori, about Māori uh, art and uh, history and whatnot. And uh, to my great disgust, the very first statement made on the program was made by a Māori saying the Māoris had no writing system. That's nonsense. I'm sorry he said that. He, they did have a writing system and that's what one of his own ancestors must have written. Now I'll get back to the Easter Island tablets again. After this excursion into two other parts of Polynesia and Micronesia, we've seen evidence to indicate that writing did exist and evidence which suggests that Easter Island is as close as anything to the original form of this writing. Let's now look at the translation or reading that Metoro gave for this line one of uh, the tablet uh, that I've been talking about up till now. That's how it looks when I put beside each sign the reading that Metoro gave for it. Now this is the kind of translation that uh, Bishop Joson gave for that. May heaven rain upon the two lands of Hotamatua, so that the king may be seated at the base of heaven. It is the land, and his eldest son comes to the land, that the canoe may sail towards his younger brother, and that he may reach the child who rises up to him in the sky, etc. Utter nonsense. 
Furthermore, it was ungrammatical. Another translator, uh, Dr. Anna, thought the bishop perhaps had not got it quite right, and he gave this rendering of the same passage. He thought it was talking about somebody called Itarangi. Itarangi gave lands to the number of two to Hotumatua. Hotumatua was the king. He was installed at the side of uh, Tirangi on the lands, the two of them, as king of the country. From his country, the canoe continues towards his native land in order to reach his son. What nonsensical writing. Why would scribes with such obvious artistic ability write such silly rubbish? It would take a lot of effort to engrave these um, tablets, and they're saying nothing that really is meaningful. My wife and I both have a similar life history of respect to our relationship to Polynesians and Maoris in particular. We both grew up in New Zealand. My wife and her brother lived in a remote part of the country where they attended a school in which everybody, every child was a Maori except the two, except her and her brother. So she had good um, intimate relationships with Maori children as she grew up. I, as a boy in uh, Wellington, had the good fortune to belong to a family that was very close and intimate friends of a Maori family, uh, whose members taught me many things about their mythology, and one of them was afterwards my schoolmaster and, still later, uh, battalion commander in World War II, which is a very strange sequence. Now, that family, uh, their European name is Hislop, that family uh, was ruling as chieftains in the southern part of New Zealand in the 1840s. The lower part of that family tree shows the people who were living that I knew. The, up, the two upper branches are their ancestors, going right back to where you see the two sides level off. Uh, that's the period when the Maoris came to New Zealand, about 1350. And then the single column of ancestors above that are uh, their ancestors back in the ancient homeland of the Maoris. I uh, show that to show the extraordinary memory that Maoris have for uh, details of their past. It's not likely that they would be making up nonsense. People so intellectual as that would not be likely to be writing such nonsensical stuff as it would appear from Metoro's reading and the bishop's translation is on the tablets. Now, as a child, as I, of course, being associated with Maoris, as I said, I became aware of things that not many New Zealanders get to know. Here, for example, is a Maori charm, or a spell, to make the rain go away. It rains a lot in New Zealand, very unlike San Diego, where it hardly ever rains. In New Zealand, we have far too much rain. And in order to have some fun outdoors, we would hope that the rain would stop. This is a karakia, as it's called, a spell that uh, Tirangi Hiroa, one of the distinguished Maori scientists, has recorded as being taught to him as a child to make the rain go away. It says, Ereri o te kotare, ki runga e te pufarawhara, ruru ni i parirao, ke māko o kuan te awa, mau mau te ua, which can be translated as on the right, fly, O kingfisher, onto the branch of Astelia, that's the Puhalawara plant, and there shake your wing, lest your young become wet with the rain. Cease, cease the rain. And uh, Tirangi Hiroa says, I never understood why I had to say that rhyme to make the rain go away, but that's what we were taught as children. Now look carefully at that. I've written out a portion of that uh, rhyme where it says A, as each line of it, as uh, Tirangi Hiroa rendered it, how he had to read it. Now, what I noticed one day when I was studying that is if you replace the, the words in A by words that sound almost the same, but not quite the same, you get a different meaning. And the top line, which says, Erere o te kotare, fly, o kingfisher, is you replace the word fly by Heriri and the ate by atta and kotare, which is kingfisher, by the verb kotare, you then get something that says storm clouds, stormy weather. And if you do the same thing all the way down as I've done there, you finally end up with a rhyme that says storm clouds, stormy weather, obey, turn about, go away, be calm, veer off in another direction. 
This makes it seem as if to make a successful spell you've got to conceal the meaning by changing the words to make up meaningless uh, sort of doggerel and uh, the spell then becomes effective. There's the last part of the spell. Now I'd like to refer to uh, something that was written a hundred years ago in 1890. Go away from the slides for a moment. Shortly before this time when this was written, a great Maori treasure that had been lost for hundreds of years was rediscovered by the Maoris in New Zealand. As soon as they found it, they knew immediately what it was. It was called the Kuratangi, or Crying Dove, a beautiful jade carving of a dove, apparently made in somewhere in Asia. And the Maoris said that their traditions told them that this crying dove had been brought to New Zealand when their original canoes came there during the 14th century. And uh, when the dove was found, various traditional poems about it were immediately brought into publicity. And here are some passages that were appeared in the transactions of the what is now known as the Royal Society of New Zealand for the year 1890. These are written by some of the leading Maori scholars of the day and translated into English. Here is a translation of a portion of one of them. Great is the love to my bird. It moves in me in the evening. Into the house enters my liver heedlessly. A day I wait, tomorrow this day. When will it lift its foot? And so on. There's a lot more. So ridiculous. Here's another version of a related poem recorded by from Sir George Gray's collection. He's one of the greatest Maori scholars. Great is my love to the babe that glows within in the evening. I enter the house myself alone. Look, girl, at the duck that swims there. It is naught. It's a Maori duck. We must take a look at the feathers. And so on. Now, as I told you, I was brought up and taught by very intelligent Maoris whom I always grew up to respect. In fact, when I was a little boy, I thought it was the brown people who knew everything and the white people had to learn from them. How, I said to myself, how could people like that, not in right such stuff, but how could they even tolerate it and repeat it? There must be more to this than we see on the surface. Now, years later, I became aware of a very rare dictionary by Stimson, Dictionary of Polynesian Spoken in, you're seeing the title page on the slide, here is the actual dictionary, uh, written by Stimson, uh, who went to the Tuamotu Archipelago, which comprises about 30 islands, and wrote down all the language of those islands. Stimson was familiar with New Zealand Maori, which was a dialect of Polynesian. The Tuamotu Islands are about 2,000 miles away from New Zealand, and the first remarkable thing that Stimson found was that the language spoken there is almost identical with that of New Zealand, although they're so far apart. One might have thought it would have been more related to Samoan or one of the other central Polynesian dialects, but that was not the case. The other surprising and very important thing that Stimson described and discovered and included in his dictionary was that there are about 5,000 words in the Tuamotu dialect which apparently have been lost from the New Zealand dialect. They must have once been present, but they're no longer there. These 5,000 words deal to, in a large way with many varieties of sexual experience and various pagan ideas, as well as some ordinary words. For some reason or other, they were lost from New Zealand. We think the reason why they were lost is that the first dictionary of Maori was written by another missionary, uh, Williams, Bishop Williams, about 100 and 150 years ago. And we think that he deliberately left out those words that he didn't like, and they were subsequently lost. We never knew, never knew they were in the New Zealand language. Taking now Stimson's dictionary, which unfortunately is out of print, I started looking at some of the uh, other Maori uh, traditional poems, absurd as they seem to be, and doing what I did with the Kingfisher poem, substituting related words 
or similar words for the ones that we have there and using this dictionary to provide some of the missing words and this is one of the little t spells that I uh, treated in this way. This is one recorded by Sir George Grey, one to make the sunshine. And according to Sir George Grey, he was writing between 1840 and 1860, very staid Victorian period. He was a Victorian gentleman in New Zealand. And he must have found it very unpleasant to have to write down this one, but he had a very strong sense of responsibility for rendering the Maori language correctly. So he wrote exactly what the Maoris dictated to him. Upoko, upoko, fititera, that means head, head, the sun shines. He kaimatu, ke kutu o taku upoko, 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 fititera. And it makes the ridiculous statement, disgusting statement, you may eat the lice of my head, 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 the sun shines. Now that was recorded as a spell to make the sun shine, but why such absurd content? Let's now treat that poem with that, like a, what I call a kingfisher transform, see what happens. Now we write out each line, just as Sir George Grey recorded it, that's the lines labelled A, so you have the first line, upoko, upoko, hiti te ra, head, head, the sun shines. And change upoko to epoko each time, and hiti te ra can remain the same. Then the next line where it says, he kai mou, te kutu o taka opoku, you may eat the lice of my head, change that to haka aima o taku to taku epokoi, and we do that all the way down, and we end up now with a poem that says, O cloud, let the sun come out. This I conjure by gesture and by chanting this spell. O cloud, let the sun come out. And our dictionary for making that translation is Stimson's Dictionary of the Tuamotu dialect. I am now, I, by this time I was convinced that we had the secret to reading the Easter Island uh, documents. We'd got to make a, uh, to use a vernacular expression, we've got to make a kingfisher, kingfisher transform all the way along. Now let's take the very first words in line one of this Aruku Kurenga tablet. The uh, rendering given by Metoro is uh, Etoe Terangi Kitehenua Erua no Hotamatua. Remember the Kitehenua Erua to the land the two was a strange ungrammatical expression. If we make a uh, kingfisher a transform, as you can call it, instead of getting the absurd rendering that the poor bishop got and his friends, we get now this one that I've rendered on the right. Ketu hiti airangi. Instead of reading Ketu itirangi, let's read it as Katu hiti airangi. And instead of reading Kitehenua Erua, line two on the right, we make it Kitehunua Erua. Instead of Henua, make it Hunua. That's the only change we make. The next line, we don't have to change that at all. We just leave that no hotamatua. Uh, when we do that, we get an, a translation which reads quite sensibly. It says, Hiti Erangi, by the way, is an old name of Easter Island. And it now says that King Hotamatua discovered Easter Island in his double canoe, or catamaran. Now, this is striking. When I read that, when I found that was the reading you could get from it, I knew that we had the solution. Because long ago, when uh, missionaries first went to the Easter Island and wrote down their mythology, they told us that the Easter Islanders said that their tradition recorded that the island had been described, discovered by a man called Hotamatua who was sailing a double canoe. But what happens if we carry out a Kingsfisher transform all the way through? Here we have in line A, Metoro's dictation, and B, the infor inferred transform, in other words, Arabus, and we're changing it. Instead of katui terangi kitahenua e, that's as I this one I dealt with before, we change it in the way as shown here, katuhiti terangi kitahunua e rua no hotomatua, and we keep on doing that. Now we get this reading. Hiti arangi was discovered by hotomatua on his double canoe. It is located at the extreme limit of the sky. The land he found to be of small extent. 
to this land he steered his double vessel constructed of two separate hulls clamped tightly together namely the Oteki and the Owa. I now knew what we had the decipherment because tradition tells us that the hulls were called the Oteki and the Owa. See how these, this remarkable piece of history was concealed in the most extraordinary meaningless doggerel. So we continue to deciphering in the same way now. I'm convinced that we have the right uh, method of dealing with it. Here is the whole of line one with the phrases that Metoro gave for all the different elements. I'm going to read the translation now only. Hiti Arangi, that's Easter Island, was discovered by Hotumatua on his double canoe. It is located at the extreme limit of the sky. The land he found to be of small extent. To this land he steered his double canoe, constructed of two separate hulls, clamped tightly together, namely the Oteki and the Owa. The double canoe continued on direct course until he, that's Hutu, cut the lashings of the outrigger, whereupon the two vessels separated, each rushing pell-mell ahead hither. He, Hutu, was the first to reach land, and he was exultant. As for the other vessel, it made a loop around the island after which those people were on board to came back into view and returned here to settle down in peace. Thus our founding father, Hoto, assumed the office of kingship. There also arrived here a chieftain of high rank so designated by the king, namely his own son, whereupon there was rejoicing. In the sky overhead there appeared a bird in flight, poised above the land. Good was that omen. Now the settlers began to search for edible materials on the island. The men started to build coops for the chickens that they had brought with them and to transfer the chickens ashore. Boundary lines were determined and root crops were planted with the aid of the cork digging stick. They brought the root crops with them, the kumara, so far as suitable places could be discovered. And here it was, the king included, they made their settlements. But they continued nonetheless to sail about here and there, always searching for good localities. And the, there they would plant root crops, green unripe fruits were also discovered on the island, and so they continued to explore. And passing now to line two. But exploration could proceed effectively only insofar as the winds remained moderate, for whenever the wind blew from the south the seas became very rough. So Manukura, that's literally red bird, the word for the chief counsellor, Manukura never would sail towards dark, gloomy cloud bank with violent and extended winds, for one could be driven ashore and wrecked by the wind when it veered to the south. Despite arguments that arose, these travels were brought to a successful conclusion. And so the people learned how to make use of calm days and to seek protection by taking shelter in unexposed places here and to withdraw from exposure and to the coldness of the wind. The narrative continues, but I'm not going to go any further. Now this is as far as I had taken my translation last year when I first presented this paper to the um, Institute for the Study of American Cultures who held a, a congress in uh, Georgia a year ago. Since then, one of uh, our members, the Vice President, Marshall Payne, has visited Easter Island and taken with him a copy of the published version of the paper I've just delivered to you in this volume of Esau. And he gave it to one of the 36 elders who rule over Easter Island now. In Easter Island there are 36 families, or hapu they're called, each of which has an elder. And the 36 elders constitute the governing council of the island. To Petoro, one of the elders, Marshall gave a copy of this issue of Aesop. Uh, Petoro was selected because he speaks English, Spanish and Polynesian. So he seemed to be an ideal person to accept it. And uh, a few weeks ago, Marshall got a telephone call from Easter Island. I'm amazed to know that you can make telephone calls from Easter Island, but uh, you can apparently. 
And he then made this note for me to Barry Phil. Put my glasses on. In a phone conversation yesterday with Petoro Edmonds on Easter Island, he related the following. He recently met with the Council of Elders and explained to them your premises for the translation of the Rongaronga tablets. There was clear agreement since the Council members merely uh, readily equated your premises with Easter Island tradition concerning reverse talking, so-called. Person A speaking to person B so that person C cannot understand the conversation. Reverse talking called for the use of words which, when spoken, sounded very close to the words that were meant, but taken literally were just gibberish. And indeed, gibberish is the apt description of the so-called translations of the tablets to date. Uh, in that this... Um, Something premise. This same premise constituted your um, your breakthrough to the translation of the hieroglyphs. Petoro was quite optimistic as to the accuracy of your translation. The islanders refer to the tablets as the talking tablets. One other thing came just recently, in on October the fourth, nineteen ninety. I received this letter from a learned. Hawaiian, Likeke McBride, who uh, lives in uh, um, the island, the big island of Hawaii, and he discusses at length what he remembers from his childhood of what he was told by the author of the standard, I don't have it here, the standard Hawaiian dictionary, um, Pukui, was told that in ancient times there was a secret language used in Hawaii in which words were used which apparently had an inappropriate meaning but were similar to words that were really intended. And then he says, almost a century later, Hawaiian guano diggers in the South Pacific originated a play language which they called Olelo Kuke Manu to keep their bosses from understanding. This speech has substitutions of forms as well as transpositions. Uh, let us come here uh, might be rendered uh, in a different way. I'm sorry, I can't read this part of the letter. But he indicates that they were speaking in a way so that their bosses wouldn't understand what they were saying. And he says, um, your hypothesis is upheld by none other than the late Mary Kawena Pukui, who co-authored the Hawaiian Dictionary, and so on. So we feel that the signs are very propitious for a successful decipherment of the rest of the tablets, and I do plan to give another instalment in uh, next year's, this year's volume of ESOP when it appears. Thank you.